What's up guys? Um, I'm going to go over today um, a 3D star, C, uh, star CCM um, CFD simulation, setting that up and running it and pulling some data out of it. Um, yeah, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I've already prepared a model in SolidWorks uh, that we'll be using here to go through. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that here in a sec, but let's start by making a new model. Um, if you click, click a new model here, you end up on this screen. Um, I'm going to select parallel on local host. This is going to run this sim on 16 processes on my computer. Um, so could run up to 32. I have a 16 core computer with hyper threading, so could run up to 32 without issue. Um, but their recommendation is to use cores. I find cores using the core number for your computer faster for meshing. Um, and the process number generally faster for the actual sim time so you can change that at the end if you want for that um, but we're just going to run with the core value now um, if you don't know how to check that um, you can go into your system about in settings um, but we're going to run it there um, we're going to use our power on demand license here to uh, run through this sim um, so we got a bunch of options here um, we run on a power on demand license on um, I can give that number out to those who need it. Um, not on broader YouTube though for my FSA team. Um, but yeah, so we'll, we'll go ahead and get this sim started here. Um, and we'll jump into a pretty empty tree, pretty sparse tree here. Um, we got our output window where you can see a bunch of some error because apparently my computer's overloaded, but that's fine. Um, some of our license information, um, and we got our properties window and our tree itself here. Um, we'll be populating this throughout the sim um, as we as we go through and set everything up, um, and we can go ahead and start in the geometry models tab here, um, subfolder under geometry, click new. I right click on that and click new um, and then we'll go ahead and right click on the CAD model um, bar here at the top select import and then we're going to import a new CAD model um, this is the one I'm working on for today um, whatever model you're working on just select it on your desktop um, or wherever you've got it saved and it will should pop in like, like so um, so we've got this here um, we're going to start working on it um, there's a few prep things that I do in in the um, CAD window here to make this work um, that we'll go over. Um, some of this is necessary, some of it's not, some of it will just make the make the process easier down down the road. Um, but the first thing we're going to do is on our list of features here, so this is kind of our timeline like you might have in Fusion um, if you've ever used that. Um, we're going to select the import um, feature and that'll, you know, it just pinked out our whole body here so it's got all of it included there and we're going to select repair CAD and open the CAD repair tool click execute just run this to make sure nothing's broken no holes no uh, weird faces they got a list of everything that might go wrong here um, but in this case it seems like our model is okay um, so that's good we're gonna close that um, and then you know, if you if you got an issue there, you can fix it. You, you it, the uh, little hammer and wrench button will not will turn pink, and then you can just click it, and it should fix it. Should fix the issues to the best of Star's ability. Um, but here we don't have to deal with that, so that's good. Uh, now I can start going through and doing some preparation. Um, so first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to um, I'm going to unite our nose and then this chassis. Um, driver body part that we have um, and then our plenum in the rear um, this will just make this a little bit easier to deal with later and down the road um, and to do that I'm just going to control click select all three of these um, and then right click go to boolean here click unite and then that will unite all of them into one part um, again not necessary um, but it will make this a little bit easier to deal with down the road and they do need to get united at some point so why not do it here? Um, so we got that. Um, we're going to delete these two plenum parts. They just come with the, the model that we have. They're not necessary because we've got a plenum body. We're 
working with. I don't know why that didn't delete. There we go, delete these items, yes. Okay, so they're gone. Um, now we got one big body there that we're gonna use for the center of the car. Um, we're gonna delete a couple other things here. Um, so we're gonna delete all the right wheels and any feature that only appears on the right side. So that's gonna be not that, that side wing right there. Um, Cause we are gonna run a half car sim with a symmetry plane down the middle. Um, so that'll essentially run twice as fast as if you were running a full car without that. Um, so that's a, that's a good thing if you're trying to pump these out. Um, and we don't need these parts for that. So we're gonna just get rid of those entirely. Um, the other thing we can start doing is start renaming stuff. So we're going to call that body. This can be our rear wheel. And this can be our front wheel. Um, so those are those. Um, this will be front wing. Uh, and renaming isn't necessary, but it will make this sim a lot easier to follow as we go through it. Um, and if you're setting up your own stuff, It'll make it easier for you to follow. Um, I've got lots of guys who come in and don't want to do this step when I'm teaching them, and then they have no idea what parts are which. So uh, it's a little tedious, but save you a headache down the road. It saved me plenty of headaches in my experience. Um, I'm also going to pull everything out of this chassis assembly um, subgroup here. Um, it has no necessity, it just has to do with the way the assembly was structured in SolidWorks and then got imported over. Um, so we'll just get rid of it like that. Don't really matter. Um, and now we've got all the parts that we're interested in kind of prepped here. Um, one more thing we are going to do is create a uh, coordinate system at the center of our wheel here because um, that'll help us define rotation. Um, again, you don't need to do this. You can define an axis of rotation when you define the rotation. Or you define an axis when you define the rotation. So you could just define it in space here with the main system. But this is going to make it a lot easier. Um, and if your wheels aren't just straight like this, um, if you're doing yaw or camber or any kind of setup, if you're doing tow, um, you, can, you can create these axes to do that. Um, and yeah, I'll run through how I did that here. So I right click on the surface that I'm interested in. I picked a concentric surface on the wheel. Um, any one of these surfaces here that might exist on your wheel model would work fine for this. Um, you can also use an edge, but this is the one I went with. Um, and we're going to create a point from the center, so right click on that surface, scroll down to reference geometry, create point, click OK. So now we got a point that we can center our axis on, center our reference frame on, and now we want to go to the same place, click cube coordinate frame from plane and surface and then click that point that we just created. Um, so now we got two of these right at the center that we're interested in. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and rename both of them. So this is our front wheel system. And then we've got our rear wheel system. So we'll be looking for those later. Um, and then I'm gonna go ahead and export the coordinate system for both. So right click and export, um, and then they'll pop over and you will be able to find them in the simulation window. Um, so now all the geometry prep that we want to do is done, or all the CAD prep, sorry, that we wanna do is done. I'm gonna go ahead and update that, just make sure everything is good there. Click close. And now we want to go ahead and create geometry from this. So we right click on our CAD, CAD model here, click new geometry part. Um, we're gonna leave everything the same here for now. Um, you know, if you have issues in the future, you could you could re-import with a tighter or coarser tessellation, but for now that should do the trick. Um, and we're gonna go ahead and create part. Uh, and now you'll see we've got a little arrow by our parts down here, and everything has shown up. If we create a new scene, if we create a geometry scene here, should be able to see everything has populated itself in here very nicely. Um, so that's good. Um, if we, if you didn't see a part in here, that'd be an issue you'd want to address right away. Um, but we've got everything in here, so we're all good. We'll work from that. Um, so we will start just doing some prep. So some, just one thing that this is a kind of a specific issue for GTMS, but 
we've got three different surfaces in our wheel here. Um, it's all one closed part, but three surfaces. We're just going to go ahead and combine those for the front and rear wheel. Um, again, not not a not an issue for running the sim, but it'll make it a little easier because we only have to set. Um, sorry, there we go. We only have to set the rotation for one surface. So combine all those there. Um, and now we've got one wheel. Um, so that's one prep thing that we want to do in here. Uh, the next thing we want to do is create a domain. So the domain in the CFD model is our essentially kind of you can think of it as a wind tunnel. Um, and it defines a, a finite region for which we're going to solve the flow. Um, we can't solve over an infinite region so we're going to come up with a finite one to solve for. Um, and uh, sorry, I'm just throwing the numbers that I know off the top of my head in here. Um, we, you can see, we want this running right down the middle of the car. Um, we've got our x and y at zero zero, so that sets that um, x z plane at the center, um, and then sets the um, x y plane right at zero, so our car sits on the ground um, as we would hope it usually does. Um, for the X in this direction, so front and back, um, general rule of thumb would be six times the reference length of your body behind and about two times in front, so negative 14 and five kind of fits that well. Assuming we've got about a two meter long car. Um, and then, um, you know, there's less of a rule of thumb for the Y and Z dimensions here, but for us, three and four meters works well. Um, sometimes you bump that up sometimes you can break it down it just depends on your model but um, generally the bigger you make your domain the slower your sim is going to run um, so there's a bit of a balancing act there um, and this these numbers balance out well for us um, I don't know whether or not they will work for your team but for your purposes but yeah so we'll go ahead and create this block create there you go oh shoot um, so you can see I just made two of them dang it um, yeah, if you click create and then nothing happens, it probably created and it nothing happened because it doesn't in the software for some reason. So we'll delete one of these. only need one. Um, we're going to re rename this to the domain because that's what it is. Um, so that'll be easy to reference down the line. Um, and then the next step for us is going to be splitting this up. Um, so I just click down into the domain on the tree here into surfaces. And then we want to go split by patch. Um, and then what this is going to allow us to do is split out surfaces that we want to assign specific properties to later down the line. Um, so we're going to assign an inlet here because we want air to flow in through this. So we're going to give properties for that. We're going to assign the road here because obviously we want the road to move, to roll, or to you know, move like we're rolling. Um, and then we're going to assign an outlet as well. Um, so we got all that. Uh, and then we are going to leave all three of the walls together um, they're all going to end up getting assigned the same sort or they're all going to be assigned a symmetry plane so they're all going to have the same properties so we can leave those together um, if you want to do something different um, you, if you want to assign specific properties to them you can um, as, but um, you can split them out the same way but we're not going to do that so we'll leave them all together um, and then we will just go ahead and rename this to walls because um, they look like walls um, so we got that. Um, we are all ready in terms of our parts here. Now we're going to move on to our preparation operations to get this all to kind of work together. Um, so first thing we're going to do is run a unite operation um, like so. Um, in this case we're going to unite the body and the side wing. Um, we're going to call this a CAD unite. Um, you really want to just unite any bodies that might have an intersection. Um, so sometimes your under tray might have an intersection with the um, body. You know, if you've got the floors together, just smack together, um, you might have an intersection there. In this case, we've got a little bit of space between those, um, so it doesn't matter. Um, you might have something weird going on here. That's usually an issue for us, but not today. Um, so those two here are the only two things that actually touch just along that surface, and we want to unite them there. Um, you know, there's other ways that you can kind of group parts together in the 
Geometry preparation, you can use a wrapper, um, but Unite is generally faster, generally easier to mesh, so that's what we're going to do in this case. Um, so we are going to first check this link output to part name box because I'm going to rename this to Arrow Unite, like so. Uh, you can see it updates here. We've got a part tied to this. Uh, we're not going to change any of this stuff right now. Um, we could if we wanted to, but uh, these the standard values work pretty decently generally. So we will go ahead with that. Uh, just click execute. Uh, it runs real fast. Now you can see you've got the arrow unite, and that's just one part with all that in there. Nice and nice and easy to deal with. Um, and then the unique thing here is if we look into inherited parts, you've got these two. Um, so you can still pull values from specific surfaces there, whereas when we unite it in the geometry or the CAD up here, um, that will not be the case later down the line. Um, so we got that. Next will be a Boolean subtract operation. Um, so we're going to do that here. Um, and we're essentially trying to kind of imprint the car into the domain half of the car into the domain because that's um, the air is going to flow through the domain so we want it to flow around that half of the car um, and that will give us the um, values that we're looking for um, so to do that we're going to select our arrow unite our domain I'm going to leave the body out because the body is included in the arrow unite um, you don't want to ever double count something in a mesh operation or a um, boolean operation like this because it star will freak out about it but <gasps> That's okay. Um, and then we need to throw the ender tray in because that's out there on its own. So those are all the, whoop, those are everything we need there. And then our target part is our domain. So we want to subtract the car from the domain to get that kind of imprint. We're going to click OK on that. Um, and we can just go ahead and run this now. Um, and you can see I saw this earlier. We have an error here that says the front wing will be treated as a sheet part. Um, so what that means in this case is there's probably a small hole, a little bit of a failure in the geometry somewhere on this front wing. Could I tell you where? No, I could not. But something we have to address here when we go on. Um, and I found a solution for this on my end. Um, if you ever see something like this, um, there's a lot of ways to fix it. Um, you could retessellate your part at a higher or lower accuracy. Um, it might just randomly fill the hole it created. Uh, you could run a surface repair on it. So you can run, I'll show you, you run here and then click repair surface. Um, sometimes that can cause issues with STAR, so I'm not going to do that now, but um, sometimes that'll fix it. Um, but in our case here, to fix it, all we're going to do is make this a CAD Boolean. That seemed to work before. Has no real impact on the sim, so that'll do it um, and for some reason CAD boolean runs faster so maybe that's just something to do forever um, and then we're going to check that we have everything in our subtract by going to scenes here new scene creating an empty scene um, and then dragging our subtract out into this scene we're going to set it as a displayer surface um, we can also set it as a scalar surface here um, nothing's going to show up there but it'll be useful later um, that scalar surface can be used to show the surface pressure on the on the car. Um, kind of see where we're getting our local loads. Um, so we'll create that now. You can see we've got a function bar showing up, but we're not going to put it, we're not going to worry about it for the moment. Um, so we got everything here. We can just hide away some of our walls so we can right click on them in the model, get rid of them, and. As far as we can tell, everything looks okay. Seems like that might be where our air is, but whatever. It's a high pressure zone, I think, so it shouldn't be too much of an issue. Front wing's looking good. All of our under tray made it in here. None of the tight spots seem like a problem. Um, yeah, you just kind of want to run through and check all the model just to be just to be safe um, and everything looks okay um, so now that we've got that um, our next step is going to be to create a mesh um, but to do that we need to assign a part to regions we need to create our regions 
Um, and regions are really just areas where air is going to flow through. Um, you've got all sorts of different type of regions. So if we ever did a radiator, um, which I will show probably in a different sim or in a different tutorial, um, you can create a porous region that has some kind of kind of um, viscous effect on the flow. Um, you can define different regions with different different materials flowing through them, but it's really just an area where f some liquid is, or some fluid, sorry, is going to be moving. Um, so we're, we want that to be our subtract that we just created. That's the region we are interested in. Um, so we can go ahead, right click on the part up here, and we're going to do assign parts to regions. Um, we're going to change this to create a region for each part, and then the second one here to create a region for each part surface. Um, the reason why you would create for each part is if you're doing multiple regions in the case of a radiator, gen that's probably the most common use for an FSA car. You're going to use several parts to model that out, and you want a region for each. I'm um, not doing that here, but you know, it works the same way, so it's good practice all over the board. Um, and then our subtract is all we're going to add here. So we got that. Click Apply. Again, nothing changes, but you can see we've got our arrow, so we've clearly got a region there. And you can see it show up here. Um, so we've got now all the surfaces um, because we set um, each part surface in here. We've got all of our surfaces have appeared in there. Um, and these we're going to assign some properties to. Again, um, that's kind of why we did our patch, um, split by patch, and that's why we did. Uh, um, we want uh, each surface in there uniquely. That's also going to allow us to pull data from the side wing, front wing, under tray, and rear wing, wherever that ended up. Rear wing, yeah. So we're going to be able to pull data specifically from each surface here. Um, so a couple things we can set before we create our mesh um, is all of our boundary conditions here. So our inlet, we want to be a velocity inlet. Our outlet, we want to be a pressure outlet, our road, um, it has a slip condition or um, like a vector condition to it that we need the physics re, uh, continuum for, so we won't worry about that. That's just going to be a standard wall. Um, and then these are going to be symmetry planes, so we'll set that there. Um, and it's good. Uh, it's not. It won't cause issues if you don't set these beforehand, but it's good because they generally have lighter mesh, different boundary layers, different boundary conditions, sorry, have different mesh conditions. So. Um, a symmetry plane and an inlet, for example, generally have a, a less um, expensive condition than um, a standard wall. Um, so you're saving yourself some cells in the mesh there. Um, but now we can go ahead and create a mesh operation. Um, so this is probably one of the bigger changes for STAR in the last few years. You used to make a mesh continua in here. Um, I guess you still can. They are planning to phase this feature out in the near future. I thought it would have been phased out by now, um, but apparently it's not. Um, that's fine though. Um, now we make our meshes in the geometry and specifically the operations here. We go down to a mesh operation and we will create an automated mesh. Um, and you know, it works the same as it ever has, just in a little bit different area. We want, our, we want to mesh our subtract, so that's what we're going to create our mesh in. Um, we want to select surface wrapper. We're going to add the automatic, automated repair, automatic repair, because um, that will repair your mesh, make it a little bit cleaner. Always a good thing to have. Um, we're going to use the trim cell mesher. Um, so uh, I guess I'll throw this back up here. This is a, essentially a square mesh, a square volume mesh. It's going to fill our subtract with um, a whole bunch of big and small squares. Um, and those will serve as our control volumes in the Navier-Stokes equation as this solves them through. Um, a tetrahedral measure is, as it sounds, it creates a tetrahedron, so four-sided polygon, or four-sided um, 3D shape with four triangles on each side. Um, very similar to the way a um, FEA solver works. Um, another good option. Um, and then the polyhedral measure it creates um, pentagon surfaces, I think, and then um, a very 
high number of sided shape based on that. Um, the polyhedral mesher usually takes a long time to actually create a mesh and then it's a little bit slower to solve. Um, the trim cell mesher, in my experience, is the fastest for both of those. Um, so you're not, there's not a huge accuracy difference, not a huge you know, final number difference, but a little bit, a little bit um, faster running is always nice. Um, so we use the, prism or the, the trim cell mesher. Um, those other options are also there if you want those. Um, and yeah, um, we're going to add a prism layer as well. So that just is a tool to refine the mesh close to the surface of different, um, all the surfaces that we're looking at. Um, and you know, obviously we've got a boundary layer there that we want to look at. So prism layer does a good job of, of modeling that area specifically. So we'll throw that in as well. Um, so now you can see it created the operation. Um, we'll go through and set some values for this. Um, so these are just kind of general values I use on an FSA car. Um, depending on how big or small your model is, if you're doing something else, you'll want to kind of come up with a decent scale um, for your specific application. Um, and that really depends on you know, how many cells you have in your final mesh and then how fine your surface mesh is to the, to the body you're interested in. Um, it can be a bit of a balancing act, but um, you know, generally, generally you can kind of fit these to any size. Um, these are just what work well in our case. Um, so we're going to use a base size of 0.1 instead of 1 meter. Um, then we're going to do everything in reference to that. So our target surface size is going to be the same. Our minimum surface size, we're going to use 0.4% of that base. Um, so you can see that gives us a minimum size of 4 times 10 to the negative fourth meters. So pretty small minimum surface. Um, that's very useful for airfoils where you're kind of refining around the leading edge here. Um, all these kind of smooth flowy shapes like to have that tight minimum surface. Um, we're not going to tweak a lot of this stuff. Um, we're going to go to the number of prism layers. The prism layer setup I've always used is 10 layers and a thickness. Um, no change there. Um, our stretching is 1.5 percent. 1.5 um, and then I'm going to use a thickness of 10%. Um, there is a way to calculate exactly how much you want out of your prism layer, um, or how big you want your prism layer to do. It has to do with um, your turbulence value over your surface. But for us, this works well. So um, but we, I don't see a ton of difference depending on you're using different prism layer sizes. So it don't matter too much for these lower speeds, I don't think. Um, we will go ahead and also. Um, sorry, I just turned on the maximum core to prism transition. Turn this on. Um, that just limits your that first layer of normal square cells in the trim cell. Um, that'll keep them a little bit smaller, um, so you have a nice transition area between your prism layer and your standard mesh. Um, we want to set our volume growth rate to very slow, um, so that'll give us a little bit of a tighter mesh around the body. Um, there are lots of ways you can optimize that. Um, you can use control volumes or, you know, you can use volume refinements or whatever, um, wake refinements. But for, for our use, this has worked well, um, and it keeps the runtime pretty fast. And then we're going to cap that maximum cell size at 100% of our base. Um, so we've got decently small cells that run all the way back um, just, to, just to get... Um, good results there. And then we're going to turn on the optimization here. Um, just gives you a little bit a little bit cleaner mesh. Why not optimize if the software wants you to do it? Um, so that's our mesher good to go. Um, everything here should be should be pretty much set. Uh, the last thing we're going to do, uh, we'll turn on the per part meshing. Again, this is not needed here when we only have one part um, in the mesher. But if you were doing a radiator, for example, with potentially three parts or more, and you want to mesh them all at once, that's a good way to do it. Um, we're also going to set the execution mode to parallel. Um, if you set it to serial, it's only going to run on one core, and it's going to take a really long time. So set it to parallel, and it'll run on all the cores you specified, and it'll take way less time. Um, so we will do all that now, and our mesh is good to go. So we're going to just right-click on it, select Execute, and it will start um, spooling up here. Uh, it's probably going to take five or ten minutes for this model. 
Um, so I'll go ahead and cut here and we'll get back with you once it's done. Okay, um, so I just let this mesh run. Uh, it took about a thousand seconds apparently, so a little over 15 minutes there for that. Not, not too, too bad. Um, we've got a lot of complex things going on here, so not any worse than I expected. Um, so we got that. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and save this. I realize I haven't done that yet, but a good time to show it. Um, just click the save button up there and then we can work through our um, file directory here and put it wherever we want. Um, for us, this is front wing 1.1 and view 2.0. So I'll give it that name just so I remember what it is later. And it's going to freeze up while this happens. So nothing went wrong that's just that's normal don't worry um, and yeah uh, so we'll go in um, first thing we want to do when we're done meshing um, if you get a sim that you're making small changes to and you um, are pretty confident in the procedure this might not be necessary but we're just gonna check the mesh just to make sure um, we got no weird um, residuals or anything in here that we're concerned about so we can go in and kind of look at places where we think we might have issues around here who knows looks fine in here maybe yeah fine rear wing looks fine um, just give it the once over um, and you can see these are all of our um, little squares projected out from the volume mesh. There's also a surface mesh in there you can check out too. But this should be good enough for right now. Um, everything looks fine to my eye. Um, so now um, what we want to do is create our physics continuum. And you'll see if we go into the continua here. Okay, froze up again. That's fine. Star sometimes does that. Usually not a problem. <laughs> can be a little scary when it happens though um, but we've saved everything so we're okay um, so what you can see here um, we've, we have a physics continuum it gets automatically created once you have a mesh um, but it's grayed out it actually doesn't have any thing really assigned to it so we're gonna go in and select our models um, this is kind of a decent standard set of models for um, a steady state low speed sim like this um, obviously, if you're doing something different or more advanced, there's a lot of different models in here you can use, um, but this is what we're going to do for the moment. Um, so we're doing gas, obviously, this is moving through air, so we'll use that there. We're not doing an oil bath or anything. Um, we're going to use segregated flow, um, so that just solves at each point individually instead of point to point. Um, works fine for this. It's a little faster than a coupled flow solution. Um, generally the answer that comes out will be roughly the same after a number of iterations. Um, so we are going to use a constant density equation of state. Um, because we're, we're going to run this at 25 miles an hour, um, FSAE cars aren't really ever going to exceed about 80 on track, 80, 90 if you're really pushing it. Um, and that is well within the incompressible regime. Um, so we're just going to make that assumption and go from there. Um, if you don't want to do that, you don't have to. You can use another model, but that's what we're doing here. Um, we're also going to use a steady model, so no, um, you know, no time variance or anything. Just go with steady for that. Um, and we are going to use a turbulent model. Um, and for us, we use K-Epsilon. Um, all of these models work a little bit differently. Um, K epsilon is a good good baseline, um, and we haven't ever really seen big changes using a different turbulence model, um, at least in our case. Um, that might change for others, but for FSA, K epsilon seems to work fine. Um, so we're going to go ahead, now that we've got that, so we've got our physics continuum. Uh, we, it, it knows now all the models that you we want to use. Um, something you can actually do to check this, we can see here, um, we can go in and we now have a bunch of options. If it will actually let me select this, there we go, for what we can set our scaler to. Um, so we want to see pressure on this, so we're going to go down and find pressure and put that in there. Um, so now if we run the sim, this will light up with a bunch of colors um, showing the pressure on the surface. Um, we'll change some stuff up there, but 
that's what we're going to do for now. Um, so in, in the physics continuum here, the one thing that we're going to want to add is an initial condition for the velocity. Um, so in my model here, velocity is entering and crossing the model in the negative x direction. We're going to set it to negative 20. Um, I said earlier we're running this at, the sim is going to get run at 25 miles an hour. Um, I have found that using a um, initial velocity just under the one that you're kind of aiming to um, level out at, um, it can help avoid some weird kind of turbulence residuals in those first few iterations. Um, it could, but like it can potentially prevent errors due to that, um, or sim failures due to that, um, and it doesn't change your end result at all. It's you know you converge where you converge, based on the um, inlet condition. Um, so, I personally run it just a little low like that to kind of keep things stable. Um, but you could run it at 25; it's fine 99% of the time. Uh, you could also not run an initial condition there. Um, and you know, first iterations are rough, but it'll get through them, and then it'll 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 steady out at whatever your inlet condition is. Um, so we'll go ahead now and move over to setting that. Um, so we're going to go into boundaries here and work through this. Um, so I just mentioned the inlet condition. We'll go ahead and set that. If you um, open this up in the tree and go down to velocity magnitude, you can set the velocity that we want through our inlet to be 25 miles per hour. Um, and that's the ultimate speed we're going to converge on. So we got that. Um, don't need to change anything for the outlet. Um, we will change for the road. I said um, previously we want this to be a vector here, um, and we want it to kind of move with the tires. Um, so that's going to we're going to set that in the tangential or in the physics conditions here. We're going to set the tangential velocity specification to vector, and then we're going to define a vector here very similar to that initial condition. Um, we want that floor to move essentially, not, not MHP, we want it to move negative 25 miles per hour in the x direction. So matching that wind speed like that, like so. Um, so now it's going to go back this way. Um, we want to do the same thing for the wheels. Uh, but we want them to be rolling in this case. And I forgot my rolling condition for the wheels, but that's okay. Um, I'm going to load a sim really quick and check the wheel condition. Wow. Two, three, five, three, five. Okay. Okay, we're good. I got my wheel condition now. Um, okay, sorry, just had to check the condition for this. Um, so we want to go in and select again tangential velocity specification. We're going to use a local rotation rate. And we are going to go into physics values. Um, this is where we set that axis. Um, so that axis that we made all the way back up in the 3D models, we want to set, um, we do the front wheel here first, so we're going to set it to the front wheel. Um, if you leave it just in the standard Z configuration here, that's going to define that um, as the um, wheel axis, or you know, the wheel axle um, for our rotation. Um, so that's great. Um, that kind of saves us a little bit there. Um, and then for this value here, um, so for an 18 inch tire with um, moving, with, you know, assuming perfect grip and we're moving at 25 miles an hour, the rotation velocity is 49.2335 radians per second. Um, again, that'll be something that changes with speed, changes with um, yaw, changes with everything. So um, there are ways you can actually write it out to calculate that in star automatically for you, but um, we're just going to plug the value in directly here. Um, we'll do the same for the rear wheel. 
Um, so again, set the tangential velocity to local rotation. Set the physics value here, set the axis to rear wheel, and then set our rotation to 49.2335, same as before. Um, so now both of those are going to rotate, um, and you know that's something that you can easily check in your velocity output. Um, you should see a little bit of kind of flow getting dragged around by the wheel. Um, and if you mess up your rotation rate, it will cause, or your rotation here, it'll cause big issues. So um, those should be easy to spot too. Um, so now we got all that. Um, our sim at this point is ready to run. Um, anything you do after that is, after this point is really just for your own enjoyment and <laughs> fulfillment. Um, but there are definitely a few things that I'm going to add to this sim and that I would generally recommend for most sims. Um, just so you know what's going on as the sim is running. Um, obviously, we wouldn't want to waste time running a sim that has a bunch of errors on it. Um, so we can we can do some stuff to kind of make sure that all is all is going to be well there um, when we get this going. Um, so first thing we want to do, um, we'll just kind of run down the tree here, going through what we want to do. Um, we want to create a derived part. Um, so we're going to create a plane, section plane, um, and we're going to, you know, the plane that I like to use for this car specifically in this model sits right, I'm sorry, right here in the y direction, and then we're going to set this at 0 0.4 meters, um, and you'll see this will kind of slice the car right through the middle here. Uh, it gives me a view of all three front wing, all three elements that we're, we're designing, front wing, rear wing, and under tray. Um, and doing this just allows me to see the vector field around all those. Um, if there's like a mesh issue and something's going crazy, it might show up in this plane. Um, alternatively, you can move the plane to search for some kind of failed residual like that. Um, it's just a nice way to kind of sanity check as you go. Um, nice visual cue to see that our sim is running right. Um, and you'll see I'm doing this all in my empty scene. We want to create a new vector displayer for this here. Um, click create and then you see we've got this line up. Um, and so this is actually somewhere that we can, you know, we're just adding new displayers into the scene as we go. Um, so this will be where all of our outputs kind of reside for this, for this model. Um, so we can go in um, uh, to our scene under the tree here. Um, and we've got our vector, section vector, and then the scalar that we made earlier when we added the body in. Um, and we can do some stuff to change this. So we'll click on the big uh, paintbrush looking icon here. Change this where it says glyph to line under full convolution. And you'll see now our big gray blob appears. Um, this is where all your lines are going to appear for your actual um, vector scene solution. Um, and now uh, another thing we can do, we're just going to hide off the surfaces and hide off our scalar scene completely here. Um, so this is uh, not, I mean, not necessary. You could run it with the scalar scene and you'll be able to see that it, see the pressure changes as well. Um, but I just like looking at the vector scene only, a little bit less to kind of comprehend all at once. Um, and uh, yeah, now, now we'll just see things update here. Um, next final step is going to be creating reports. Um, so this will allow you to watch force values as you go. Um, again, you don't need that for every iteration, but it just kind of can be nice to see, um, you know, if something diverges off into infinity, if you're making 400,000 pounds of downforce on a part that you kind of expect around 20, that's probably a problem and you should address that. Um, so it's nice to have these values showing in, in the event that something like that happens. Um, so we'll go ahead and put some in here. Um, and the way we do that, um, just right click on report. We're going to do a new report. Um, first one we'll do is the center of loads. Um, so this was not a feature in Star when I started learning the software. It is now, which is very nice. So this will allow us to calculate center of pressure on the fly throughout our simulation. Um, so I just set the units to inches you know, 
my team what works in inches star has no problem computing everything it has all the all the conversions built right into it actually does all the math and metrics so it just converts for you um, we'll set the vector that we're interested in to negative one um, so that'll give us a positive value for how far the um, how far the center pressure is behind the front axle because um, our front axle is our zero point on this car and the X direction points towards the nose um, so this way we'll just get a nice um, positive number to look at as we do this um, we're gonna throw just our side wing front wing under tray and rear wing in there um, we're looking at the balance of those parts specifically you can look at the whole car easily in here just keep adding other stuff in there um, you can you can very easily do that um, so we'll also rename this just call this center of <gasps> pressure um, and now we want to create a monitor and plot for this um, so a monitor is going to be just a number that appears down here in your output console as the as the sim is running so we'll be able to see a number for this every time and that'll you know help us catch an issue if it occurs um, and the plot will allow us to look at a plot later um, so we can see if this converged or if it's bouncing around maybe there's an issue there um, and you know that'll help us discern whether or not we need to keep running the sim um, so we're going to create monitor and plot and now you can see an empty plot has appeared um, we can just close out of that we don't need to look at it right now um, so next we're going to make a bunch of force reports um, so same process just click force instead we'll do this in pounds we can start with our full car drag force um, so we'll throw all of our arrow parts in here see how much drag they're creating like so um, we'll rename this drag full package um, so full arrow package drag cool um, we want to um, then you can actually copy these reports so we can copy control C control V um, I don't know why they put the copy feature but no back button in here but that's the way it is we'll make one that is called downforce full package um, so that is going to be the downforce of the full arrow package and all we need to do for that is set our direction vector for that force in the negative z direction obviously you can see negative z based on this axis would be straight down so we got that and then we can copy paste rename we'll do one for the front wing downforce front wing downforce f uh, just you want to click off everything that you didn't do I just really quickly did that to do that double click there um, just add the front wing only to that um, we can copy again rename we can do downforce s downforce for the side wing just click everything off there and then we will add our side wing like so paste again we can rename this so this will be down down force of the under tray click it off and we'll add our under tray in there and then we need one more for our rear wing so we can call this down force rear wing and throw our rear wing in there uh, so those are all the reports I'm gonna run um, you could you could run as many as you want um, these don't really have a huge impact on the computational speed of the sim um, at least some of them most of them don't the force ones don't um, you know you can you can figure out mass flow um, we use that for radiators when we're testing those um, you can figure out your moment on your airfoils that might be useful if you're doing a DRS or something um, that kind of thing um, you can also calculate um, so a, you, in a report you can calculate different stuff you can calculate frontal area um, so that's gonna be really useful if you're using co if you need to find a coefficient 
Um, you're going to want to use calculate frontal area using this. Um, it's very fast, very it doesn't require any work on your part, so that's good. Um, we can look at um, other stuff. So you can actually look at how much memory you're using, how much time you're taking to solve. Um, so if you're looking to optimize the speed of your sim, um, these might be good reports to throw in. Um, and those can, you can spit those out to report every time. So you've got those as well. Um, and then other stuff, you know, if you want to figure out how many elements are in your, your um, mesh, you could do that too, that kind of thing. So lots of stuff you can do here, but we're going to use it to track all these forces. Um, and another thing we're going to do um, is add these all as one, um, sorry, one graph. So these all our drag, all our pound forces are going to show up on one drag, one graph here. The way we're going to do that is select these in the order that we want them to show up down here in the, in the console. Um, you can't change this after if you've done this. It's not a big deal, but if you want, you know, if you have a small screen, you want certain ones to show up without having to scroll to the side, make sure you select them in the right order. Um, so we're going to go FP, full package, downforce, front wing, side pod, or side wing, because, you know, that's a new part for us. We want to see that number for sure. Under tray, rear wing's old, so I don't really care about that. And this is an FSA car, so we care about drag the least. Um, so select them in that order, create monitor and plot from report, and we're going to create a single plot. Um, so now this is going to have all of them at once. Um, nice, easy to look at, um, nice place to go for all that data. Um, and then we'll have a bunch of different monitors in the console. Um, so now we're really ready to run. Um, this is everything that I'm going to set up to get this sim going. Um, I'm just going to close this other thing that I had open. Hopefully it doesn't cause any issues. No, it doesn't. Um, we don't need our geometry scene. We'll open our main scene here. Get rid of this geometry scene. Um, it didn't update, so it's kind of useless now. Um, and from here, we will go ahead and start running this. So I'm going to go up here, hit this green flag. That's going to initialize the solution. Um, and I'll essentially apply our starting conditions to this. Um, and just kind of make sure that everything is good to run. If you forgot something, this will generally catch it. If there's like some really simple error, um, this will generally catch it. Um, hopefully, it doesn't catch any right now. I think we should be okay. Um, but yeah, it's good to good to initialize first. Make sure everything is working fine. And we're good there. Um, so we can. I'm gonna. I always initialize and then save. Um, if it gets through initialization, your sim should be good to go. Um, but if you have an error at this point, now you can go straight back to this point where you initialized. Save yourself a little bit of hassle. I'm also looking at this. Going to change one thing before we get rolling. But this might take a second to save because I think this is a pretty heavy mesh. Yeah, 39 million cells. Goodness. Um, Georgia Tech is definitely pushing our meshes here. Um, we are going to really quickly set the vector field unit to miles per hour. Um, again, you can change this to anything you want in here. Um, Star has no problems with those conversions. Um, and by setting it to miles per hour, um, we'll just get it. It'll be easy to kind of refer back to the velocity that we have um, going in there. Um, so yeah, now we're totally good to go. Um, I'm not going to save it after that because it doesn't, it's not a huge change. I'm pretty sure I can figure that out if it crashes. Um, but I will let this run um, and then we'll come back and I can show a few things that I like to do just to, um, just to kind of grab data, um, grab some understanding of what's happening from this sim. Um, so yeah, we'll let it run here. Maybe we can get an iteration or two before I sign off, and we'll we'll see you soon. All right, we're back. Um, I let this sim run for a thousand iterations uh, once we got everything set up, and I'm going to run through a couple of the ways that I like to go through and pull data from these sims, um, look at numbers, and um, look at places where we might want to change something down the line. Um, so starting here, um, I pulled up 
Uh, if you've got all your reports set up right in here, um, created monitor and plot from each of these, you should have a set of plots that look like this. Um, you may have a whole bunch of different individual force plots. Um, I've got all of my forces here together. Um, makes it a little bit easier to look at. Um, you'll also, if I exited out of this sim and came back to it, but um, if you just finish running it, you'll have your um, output down here that reads all the recent force values. Um, we can look at it in this plot as well. Um, so we can see, you know, we can just mouse over all this, see what each individual part is making. Um, so our total package here is at 34 pounds, which is pretty good, um, at least for us. <coughs> um, and we can also kind of note the stability here of the sim um, based on some of this data. So our line here is pretty flat. That's good to see um, if we've got weird jumps in this a thousand iterations in. Um, probably don't have a sim that's converged. Um, you can also check that if we look at our residuals here. Uh, so we got a set of nice, very converged residuals. Um, pretty flat, so that's good to see. Um, but yeah, we can look at all of our data here. Um, you can also run a report if you wanted to get an exact number. Um, so if you wanted to know exactly what our most recent value for downforce was, you can right-click on that report, run it, and then you'll have something come out in the output down here. In our case, that is 32 for 34.2 pounds. Um, that's for the half car, so that's pretty good. Um, we can move on. Um, the other thing, um, so if you set up the scene, your scene one here, or um, your empty scene the way I did, um, that will be kind of where we do all of our post-processing. Um, we've got the vector plane that would have been um, from the last the last section. Um, Hopefully we've got a scalar section or a scalar um, output as well that we can look at, um, and we'll flip over to that. Uh, these pretty colors are really where we're gonna um, draw a lot of data to work with. Um, so we can we can start here. I've got my pressure scene open, my scalar scene. So that's this one here. Um, if you don't have this set up, all you have to do, um, at least to get the surface pressure on the car like this, is just grab in your parts grab your subtract, drag it out, and add it to a surface scene. If you don't have a surface scene, you can create a new displayer, um, and that will drop it in there. I've already got it, so we won't do it now. Um, but a couple things I like to do just to make this look kind of pretty and um, be a little bit more, more legible for us, um, set this contour style to smooth blended. doesn't make much of a difference, but it gives you a nice smooth lines all over the place here so it's a little easier to look at if we were to set it to automatic it's going to fill based on the mesh so not too much of a difference but we've got now a chunky <laughs> chunky looking surface there um, to work with so again not a big deal but that looks better in my opinion um, the other thing I'm going to do is set the minimum and maximum on our scalar field here. Um, you can have this auto range, so you can you can have it pick its own ranges. Um, you'll see there is an extremely high, um, and I'm using pressure here. If you right click on your bar for your scalar here, you can change whatever your scalar you want. Um, there's certainly a lot in here to choose from. Um, this pressure, if we click on that, is a um, gauge pressure relative to the atmospheric, which is set in your continuum. Um, yeah, somewhere in here. It's in your actually reference values. So reference pressure, um, we're referencing that. Um, but you can see if we let it auto scale, we've got a big green blob, which is very useless to us. Um, and the reason why we have that is because if you look really closely here, We've got a really high pressure zone right where the tire contacts the ground in front and then a really low pressure zone right where the tire contacts behind. Um, you can see that here, um, 8,000 gauge in one direction, negative 8,000 in the other. Um, everything else that's generating lift is in a much smaller range for that. Um, so I like to go in and just set the scalar field range here. Um, 
generally I find that negative 500 to 500 works pretty well. Um, having an even scale like that also helps us know where exactly we're making or where we're at zero pressure. Um, so it's a nice nice reference to have it even like that. Um, we can see where we're making a lot of local low pressure. So right there is the spot where we're probably generating quite a bit of downforce. Um, same here. Uh, we can look at the rear wing as well. We've got some interesting pressure gradients there um, to work on. Um, so this is a great way to really dial in where, where your load is. Because um, obviously low pressure points are going to have a lot of downforce. Um, high pressure points are can or can't be, or may or may not be um, important. Um, you know, sometimes we can look at the rear wing here. We've got relatively high pressure, but the low pressure is more more important. So that helps us helps us um, see that here. Um, the other thing we can do, um, so I hit away my plane section. Uh, we can toggle the visibility off on that and look at some plane sections of the car. Um, so this is the, uh, the section that we had created earlier that we're kind of watching as we go. Um, this one I changed the um, position. So if you click edit part, right click on that, click edit part in current scene, um, you can slot this through so we can put this back to where we had it. Um, you, know, you can change the positions of all these planes wherever you want to see the slice. Um, so that's the original slice we had. Uh, we can see where we've got high, high velocity and these also generally correlates to those little pressure zones that we're looking at. Um, so we can kind of see where we're, where we're making downforce and where We've got problems. Um, it's also good to look at separation in this kind of plane. Um, so you can see we've got a little bit there that we might want to watch out for. Um, same here, the, the front wing that might be intended. Um, we've got some <laughs> separation we're going to want to work through there for sure. Um, lots of things we can look at. Um, vector scenes also allow us to um, find vortices, whether those are desired or not. Um, so you can see a nice, pretty obvious one swirling up here at the intake of the under tray. Um, so things to look out for there. And obviously we can, we can move this through. Um, and we can also put them in different, um, you know, any orientation is, is acceptable. Um, so we can show, I made a second plane section. Again, same method to do this, just new part, section, plane and then you can place it wherever you want. This one we're looking at the floor. So we can we can grab the standard view for this, which is right there. Um, we can kind of see um, how the air is moving through our tunnel here, how it's moving under the, under the front wing. Uh, we can see the vortices of our tunnel strakes. We can see the big um, vortex along the side here. Um, so things we're, we're watching out for there, uh, we can kind of start to start to look at our tire wake. Um, so there's uh, many things that you can kind of pull out of these different planes as we go. Um, and they're very flexible, easy way to look at uh, anything you might be interested in. Uh, one more tool that I like to use um, in kind of in this velocity um, vector um, scene um, as well is something called an isosurface. So I'm going to hide these away to kind of show this because bring back our scalar scene. There we go. Um, this is going to look a lot clearer in reference to the body of the car, um, but we will show this as well. Um, so what an isosurface is, is a surface generated based on a value threshold. Um, so in this case, we're using a value called Q criterion. And I'll edit this and we can look at it a little bit, um, which essentially um, looks at or you know, compares the, the flow in our X direction to our Y direction here. Um, and points with high vorticity are going to have high relative Y flow. Um, so 
it, as you can see, it clearly defines a lot of the big vortices on the car using this. Um, we got some residuals in other areas, but we aren't we aren't so concerned about that. Um, but this gives us a good look at the flow structures um, close to close to the bodies of the car. Um, so on a lot of the on a lot of the wings, we we get um, exactly what we're looking for there. Um, and as well, it highlights the big vortex structures that we're we're interested in controlling um, in driving around the car. Um, so here we set this ISO value to 7,000, um, and that's just our threshold value. So it creates a surface where that um, ratio is over 7,000. Um, and this is what comes out. You can play with this kind of thing. Um, if you go higher, your kind of residual um, isosurface is going to dissipate, but you're going to get smaller vortices, so they might be a little harder to analyze. Um, it's just a balancing act there. Um, we could change this to 10,000. That tends to work pretty well. Um, and get a view for what that looks like and should automatically update. This one takes quite a bit of computing power um, to really work its way through. Um, yeah, we'll give it a sec here. Uh, but yeah, this is a um, great tool to really look at important, important structures on the car. Um, there's lots of different methods of analyzing vortices. It's an important part of race car design. Um, and in my experience, this is one of the more straightforward ways to figure that all out. Um, so we can see some of the big structures, our outwash vortex here. Um, it's quite powerful, which is good. We're driving a lot of air that way, which we like to see. Uh, we can see where we're getting one here and one there, and they're coalescing pretty well. Um, we can see stuff like the um, ceiling vortices coming into play through here and through here. Um, we can see the vorticity created by our strakes, which is very cool, um, very useful. We can kind of quantify the, uh, or at least quantize the power of these and what they're doing. Um, you can see we're getting a lot of local load there because of this big vortex, so that's really good. Um, but yeah, this allows us to really analyze that those flow structures in um, an efficient and meaningful way, um, in my opinion, is the best way to look at vortices. Um, we can see stuff like these generators here; uh, they're not doing much, so that was a failed experiment. We can we can drop those in future iterations, which is good to note. Um, yeah, um, we can see our um, front wing vortex here. It was well well directed in the way that we kind of hoped, right over the top of our um, inner front wing. Um, we may or may not want to do more to control that, but it structure is pretty clear there. Um, so again, this is a good way to look at these. Um, good way to quickly analyze all of our vortex structures and see where changes might need to be made. Um, but yeah, this is how I pick these simulations apart, um, how I get the information I'm looking for out of them, generally speaking. Um, yeah, not too, not too much to it there, but we'll, we'll get what we need. So thank you for watching. Hope this was, hope this was helpful.